dug up my own clay tablets and that was so magical. I think just being there in the desert and experiencing that, being there where I really found myself almost because you're just in this desert where everything else is on pause. There's no internet. If I wanted to talk to anybody on the phone, I had to stand on the roof of the excavation house. We didn't have any contact with the outer world. It was just us and that was so magical. So for me, that was really the moment where I thought, this is what I need to do. Ask Different, der Podcast der Einstein Stiftung mit Leon Stebe. Irene Sibbing Plantholz is looking back and forward at the same time. She studies how people experience time in ancient Mesopotamia. And we will talk about her magical moment and about lifetime three, four, five thousand years ago. Her focus is how life was perceived, especially when confronted with illness and death. So here we are in the midst of a pandemic. What was it like back then and what could we learn from this today? Irene Sibbing Plantholt is a serologist, research associate at the Einstein Center Kronoi, a center that researches time and time awareness in the ancient world. So welcome Irene and thank you for being my guest today. Thank you for having me. What do you know? How was time experienced during epidemics back then in ancient Mesopotamia? So they were much more experienced in handling pandemics or epidemics in a way. Than we are. Yeah, because they they were much more used to, to being confronted with them. For us, this is really something new that a lot of people have not experienced ever. And just like we have now, they they would want to keep track of it. They're afraid of it and they are waiting for it to be over. And they didn't have the means that we have nowadays to fight infectious diseases, but they could, for instance, keep distance and try, in their case, the epidemic wasn't caused by little microorganisms, uh, but by deities. And what they could do is try and appease these deities that inflicted these. So it was a time of rituals, a lot of praying yes. to these deities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's also practical things. So for instance, keeping distance, uh, saying people shouldn't go in each other's houses, some rough things like people that are living in infectious areas shouldn't go out and people shouldn't go in and wait for the last person to die. So this is yeah. social distancing. Yeah. In the like ancient in the world. Yes. But in that, not to prevent disease, but when it's there not to spread. That's the difference, I guess, than what we have nowadays. How did the people deal with this situation? You said that there was a high level of uncertainty as well mm -hmm. as we have. But today we have apps, we have science, we have Netflix and <laughs> stuff like that. But nothing close existed at that time. The sources that we have nowadays on what happened during epidemics are mostly letters. And there's some other slivers of literature. You will find some, you have, you have omina, so predictions of what will happen. Let's say a baby is born and has three feet. This will have to, these and these consequences. And these consequences can have bearings on the entire countries, for instance, an epidemic. And then it says there will be an epidemic. Uh, people should not go into each other's houses. So there we give these little tiny pieces of information. Mm -hmm. uh, but letters are the most interesting because they report on current affairs. So it will be, hey, in this town there was an illness going on. This is the current state and that will be written on, on clay tablets and that then will be sent with a messenger to, for instance, the king. They will report, hey, in your kingdom and this in this area there are diseases and it's spreading rapidly. Yeah? In one day it went from one to ten people. People are dying. Uh, this is the current situation. And these letters are your sources yes. to know what happened back then? Yes, of me and my colleagues, yeah. Wow. So what do you do with this, with these sources? Yeah, so maybe it's good to tell you like what my sources look like. So this is, of course, not written on paper. We're very lucky because of that, because they're preserved. They're written on clay, in clay tablets. And yeah, we have clay tablets that are 5,000 years old and they record how people lived back then. And these letters are part of that. And so these can be very like little, I said, little peaks into mm -hmm. life, life back then, 2000, uh, 4000, uh, 5000 years ago. 
And I'm actually specialized in, in letters, or I've done a lot on medical letters also, on the, the writing, how doctors are treating their patients. And um, they How do you feel? How do you explore or feel how the time was perceived back then? That's a hard question, because just the way like we do, there's different ways to perceive time. Mm -hmm. yeah? And my focus is like, yeah, I, I'm interested in illness. I'm interested in how people perceive their lifetime and how they want to extend it and keep it healthy. And so therefore, my research project within the Einstein Center Kona is on, on the perception and concepts of lifetime. So that is something I focus on. How did they think about their lifetime? Where does it start? Where does it end? Is it measured? How is it measured? Are there parts of life that are more important or less important? Is it, is it better to be young or is it better to be old? Do you lose your humanity when you're a certain stage? For instance, when you're old and you first start to forget things, uh, does it make you less human? These are the things I find interesting. And there are, it's hard because we have, we have hundreds of thousands of clay tablets that are stored in museums all over the world, some in private collections. And where do you start if you have a question like that? This is also what we do at the Einstein Center Konoi. As people like, like me that are studying the ancient world, we have so much data, but we don't always have to write questions. And at Konoi, we have a platform where people from natural sciences, uh, social sciences and humanities come together and then we come up with questions. So questions could be, how is time perceived? And how do they think about uh, lifetime? Did they measure it? Did they find it valuable? And then I go to my sources and I dig through them and I see if I can find something. It's not that I have 20 sources of people saying this is how I feel, but I have some and I can draw these together and then try to weave a... Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. What could we learn from Mesopotamians? What do you learn from them? What I learn from them? Well, I learn from them that it's very important to understand the other we a lot of times have an idea about people that you, know, not, you cannot identify with mesopotamians are removed from us geographically and in time so what do we have in common with these people people like to often think about them as exotic or obscure what happened back then doesn't have any bearings on us but it actually does it makes us there's lots that we have in common for instance time and yeah, we all have a short lifetime, doesn't matter if you live now or if you live then, we're all confronted with only being able to live for a certain amount of time and it makes us very vulnerable. Seeing the humanity in others, also people that lived 5,000 years ago that I have no connection with, seeing that we have something in common, that we're all humans and it helps to have empathy for others and understand other people. And that's what they, what, they, what they teach me, that we have a lot of, we are all different, uh, but we have a lot of things in common. So that's basically the bigger picture of why I do this, why I'm interested in ancient Mesopotamia. I mean, it comes to concretely learning something from them in what they do is, I guess, living more in the moment. Uh -huh. um, yeah, that is interesting, I think, that uh, uh, because they couldn't do anything else. I mean, I don't know if this is true. They also longed, they also looked forward to things or looked back at things or, or wished that they would have made it to a certain point in life and they can't. But they also have to live more in a moment because, so for instance, with pandemics, where we have something to look forward to, a vaccine or there's an end coming in sight, they didn't have that. So what can they do? They cannot be living towards summer 2021 when the pandemic will be over, where I am with my head <laughs> since March. And for them, this was what it was. And, and they had to just deal with the situation in that, in that very moment. I think that is, uh, yeah, what and, I wish I could do better. And we get a new perspective. Yeah. Uh, I have an example, if you if mm -hmm. you like. There's an example from a prayer from a man to his to his God, and so this is this is the copy. So we have we we read clay tablets, and we have to then these are three dimensional objects, and uh, to read them we copy them, mm -hmm. make a copy, and then we translate it. So this example says it's a prayer from a man, and he's lamenting that he's gonna die. He feels like he's gonna die. Things are not going well for him, and then he says, "I have reached wealth." Uh, precociously achieved my goal, but old age has confined me to my bed before my time, and I weep because I did not experience the beauty of my life. Like that is something that my father could say. You yeah. know, that this is this is really brings you close to somebody like that. So it seems that you you think differently about time now. 
Yeah, and I'm yeah, I With yes, your research. And I, yes, and I also so I research <laughs> it's uh, sad. Yeah, when you research a lifetime, you automatically also research death. That's a big uh, topic for me too. I've written a lot about uh, emotions about lifetime and the end of it. And there I've learned a lot too in the way they they think of death. So for them death is also a they, they personify it so that they get a better grip on it in the way we do that too. Eh? And we do it in art, we do it in, in speech, and we talk about death coming near. They do that too, and they're afraid of it, but they also accept it in a way. There's also this beautiful just acceptance that it's going to happen. And there's one uh, letter that I have where uh, somebody reports on, on the death of somebody's son, or uh, it's about a man who's supposed to show up for work, but he can't because unfortunately... Death, the Lord of mankind, has taken his son away. And so the Lord of mankind, yeah, he is, we cannot do anything to death. He, in a way, he controls us. And most of the time he's not there, but he can show up whenever he wants. And this is a, a reality that we have to accept that none of us is invincible and death can come anytime. And that has really grounded me. Yeah, when I think about life and death and, yeah. You need to ask different. Yeah. You need to ask different. What is different in your research? Well, what's different in, I think, in my research in Assyriology in general, Assyriology being the, the studies of the ancient Near East, is that we're mostly focused to think about long-term development and, uh, you know, developments of state and development of writing and scholarship and science, these long durée things. And I think I like to really focus on, on people and on, so like this, this man who was just, uh, so personal stories. I really like personal stories. Mm -hmm. Yes. That is what I, what I focus on. So this started already when I was researching illness, looking at medical reports and how, how doctors report on their patients and through these reports try to see the patient behind it. I really like yeah, personal accounts and, and, and these like little micro history things that bring me closer to these people. And this, not everybody does that, not everybody can do that and in the sense of um, they have re yeah, research questions that that force them to to draw on, 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 on bigger processes, but this is something that I really like to focus on, social history. Social history. I guess I'm not the first person who's asking you why you're doing that. First, you wanted to be a teacher, yes, right? Yes. And now you're a, a sociologist. Yeah. Yes. How the, come? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So I always had, so from very young on, I was interested in the ancient world. And I remember this book in the bookshelves, and it's called Terug naar de Olympus, uh, Back to the Olympus. And it has all these stories about Greek and Roman heroes. And I love that. So my dad really exposed me to these things. And I studied, of course, classical history then in high school. But there was always also this idea that I really wanted to teach. So what I then did... After high school, as I took a year off, I worked it was an office job <laughs> and I was thinking like, what do I really want to do? And I immediately started missing research. So I started to just then sort of read up myself and immediately knew that by the end of that year, I really needed to go back to university or needed to go to university. And back then there was a, uh, or there still is a study called Outheitkunde in Amsterdam, ancient cultures. And I wanted to do that. And I was going to study Greek and Latin. That was what I wanted to do. And the teaching was at that point, I thought maybe I can do that at another mm -hmm. time. That's, and also knowing now, it's also a part of your job as an academic, but I didn't know anything about that back then. So I studied that. And the first day of class, Ancient Cultures also has a seriology or used to have that. And there was this intro class. And they presented this curious writing and these new languages that I had never heard of. And I was immediately passionate about this. Like, I need to do this. Like, this is something completely crazy. <laughs> this is a new script. This is a new language. So I started to, to, to take these classes instead, instead of Latin. And I loved it. And I was good at it. And my teacher, after three months, said, guys, I'm going to be gone for a month. My teacher, Frans Wiggerman, who still is a very dear mentor of mine. Mm -hmm. He went to Syria. I said, I'm not there for the whole month. I'm in Syria. I was like, what? This was in 2003. I'm, I'm in Syria. I said, what? You go to Syria to look at these clay tablets? And then he said, yes. I do that every October. And then I'm part of an excavation. And I said, I need to do that. So I signed up. And that 
August, the following August, I was allowed to come on the excavation. And for three months, I was in Syria. I was there where these things happened. I saw the things that they used to see. I The next year I came along again and I dug up my own clay tablets. And that was so magical. I think just being there in the desert and or the steppe and experiencing that, being there really convinced me. So as soon as I got back from that excavation, I switched to full Assyriology uh, in Leiden. And, and this was your wow moment. That was my wow moment. Being there in Syria, I it was also a, a weird, uh, talking about time, there was also a weird sense of timelessness there, where I really found myself almost, because you're just in this You're just in this desert where everything else is on pause. There's no internet. If I wanted to talk to anybody on the phone, I had to stand on the roof of the excavation house and sort of hold my hand up to get any service. So we didn't have any contact with the outer world. It was just us and the people that we study. And that was so magical. So for me, that was really, yeah, the moment where I thought, this is what I need to do. Do you ever feel moments of doubts or setbacks? No, yeah. I think academia is really is a really hard career path. What got me this far, as I said, I've been doing this for, for 17 years and I've been very lucky. I've always had a job. After my PhD, I was able to, I did my PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. I studied here in Berlin, my master's, then I went to Philadelphia where I worked for a year and then I got here. Most of my friends and colleagues, they're wonderful, they're fantastic, they're brilliant, but we can't get jobs. They are just simply not there. So it is a mix between passion and perseverance to get where you are and a lot of sacrifices. And there are moments where you're wondering, like, do I do I still want to make these sacrifices? And um, I again, I'm, I'm very lucky. And so far, I don't have anything to worry about. But you always need an exit strategy. And that is also very tiring. So that that is hard. So the reality of being a seriologist is not always pretty, but what we do is just so much fun. <laughs> it's really hard to 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 step away from it or say like, I prefer a constant eh, permanent job somewhere when I can be reading these mm-hmm. fun tablets. Yeah. So it's, uh, live the moment. You said yes, very much. That is a very good advice. Like, and and you never know what's going to happen. I never thought I would be sitting in, when I finished my. PhD. I never thought I would be sitting in Einstein Center Konoi three years later doing a podcast with you. <laughs> so <laughs> it brings you, yeah, it brings you to. So with the Einstein Center Konoi, yeah. when what kind of circumstances you are working here? At the Einstein Center Konoi, we have a basic team. So we have three directors and three assistant of these directors, and which one uh, I am one of those. And so we work together and we're very closely with my two colleagues. And then we have fellows in the house. So every year we invite. Uh, a fellow colleague or group of fellows that come and work here at the Konoi House and that work on their own research on time within their discipline. And then we have research projects and that also come together during, we come together during workshops and uh, we have a regular Konoi talks, as we call it, sort of a lecture series and then workshops that we organize. Uh, and then we, yeah, we, we exchange and talk about our questions about time and we learn what kind of questions they ask, which we then can use for our own research. So I had a, I organized a workshop, Rethinking a Lifetime. And there I had fellows, a psychologists, uh, we had a neuroscience, cognitive neuroscientist, Egyptologist, all these people from different fields coming together and talk about how they would study a lifetime. And that, yeah, that gives great ideas like very innovative and, and, and unusual ideas that I otherwise were questions that I otherwise never would have asked what do you do when for example you're not knowing what really happened you are not able to connect the dots or the pieces you yeah. see that's frustrating that happens a lot just my sources I have to connect dots because a lot of these clay tablets uh, are broken so you have to fill in the blanks there already and that's where it starts And then, yeah, you ask a question. And, and as I said, I have tons of sources, but yeah, the answer is not always, I don't even know if I'm going to find anything. For instance, I written something on death and, and, and emotions or like way grief and sadness uh, was expressed. And I was wondering if most of the time grief and sadness is expressed with sound. Are they ever quiet when they're grieving? Like that is something I was interested in. And then I look... 
through all these texts to find something. And of course, I go now first to the words for, for silence or quiet. And then I go through all these texts and see if there's ever a connection to death or sadness. And I, I can spend a week on that and find nothing. Yeah, that happens. And and do you find something? In this case, I didn't. <laughs> sadly, <laughs> sadly. Well, there is, there is, as in uh, silence means death. But I didn't find anybody stating that they were silent because somebody died. So they can have a passive gesture, like being like laying on the ground or sitting down. But I haven't heard anybody basically not speaking anymore because they were so grieved. So maybe I'm not, I'm not done looking for it yet. But at this point, I haven't found anything yet. So it's a lot of like spitting. You're spitting and you don't even know if you're going to find the needle in the haystack. So it's, <laughs> that is sometimes really frustrating. Also really fun because you always find other things yeah, when you're doing that. You need to learn, that's what I'm learning now, more about our ancestors. Mm -hmm. Because with this, we are able to understand better our life yeah. today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is and that what, what is your approach as well? Yes, yes. And our fellow humans, you know, in a, in a time of a pandemic, I guess, and uh, other sad things like uh, the death of George Floyd, where we all have to think about how we live with other people and now we're all vulnerable and what i really learned is that no life is less important you know people are dying of corona we cannot say this person deserves less of a treatment than another person that is of course a very current issue right now we have things under control but when it spikes then who is getting the treatment for who is the ic bed but there is no life less valuable and um we are called to yeah i, I feel really called because of this Yeah, diff difficult time, which we were, a lot of us are confronted with illness and death, calls for empathy. And I, as, as I said, I kind of learn from that through through seeing the human in, in, in people on a clay tablet. And what is your top number one wish for your study, for your research, for your scientific work? Is there a special task or a special goal you have? Well, right now, my now right right now, I'm in the middle of finishing preparing my uh, dissertation for publication. So it's about to be ready and it's about to be sent to the publisher. That is right now my <laughs> first goal: getting this book that I've worked on for 10 years. Uh, this is this book on healing deities and healers in Mesopotamia. That get that out. That would be such. A relief and an accomplishment to finally have my book on the shelf and be done with that. So from yeah, I'm just thinking in the present. Mm -hmm. <laughs> This is in the present what I really, really need and want to finish the book. So you will try to learn more from our ancestors. Yes. So that's that's, that's your important. passion. Yes, that is certainly obsession. my passion. My almost <laughs> an obsession. Yeah, yeah. No, my, my family members will certainly agree with <laughs> calling this an obsession. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do get really sucked into it and. Uh, Yeah, it's hard to hard to let go. Yeah, so just continue it. And for me, yeah, what keeps me drive what I really want to do is just contribute to contribute to our understanding of this of this fascinating society. And yeah, that is what my goal is for the future, just to make it also more accessible to others, hopefully. So we are not always the most accessible discipline. As we talked about, you need to know a lot of languages and to be able to access these sources and, and that makes it complicated, but Just bringing it out into the public is really important to me. And there comes the teaching in again, too. Mm -hmm. Like I really love to teach. And yeah, that those are ways also to little children. I actually, I worked in the States. I worked uh, with multiple schools where I would go in and teach modules on Mesopotamia. And I'm, I'm doing another, another one again this uh, fall online. Um, so that really gets me excited. And it's about... A connection between the past and the present. Yes. So that's what yes. they are doing. Yes. Yeah, and between humans in general, I guess. Yeah. And that's what I learned from this conversation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. My guest today, Irene Zibbing Plantholt. She is a serologist, research associate at the Einstein Center Kronoy. And my name is Leon Stiebe. Thank you for listening to this episode of Ask Different, the podcast from the Einstein Foundation. I hope you will tune in next time. Till then, tschüss and bye-bye. <laughs>